Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's going to be our first panel at the Money Tech stage. And uh, what an interesting topic which we would be dis discussing. It's about the changing entrepreneur uh, and investor dynamics. Over the last few years, we have actually seen uh, the so called stars of the startup community have now come under the regulator's eye, and uh, a lot of issues are coming up with regards to corporate governance and various other factors. So it's time that uh, investors are also becoming more cautious about uh, unit economics, discussing profitability and what kind of growth they are seeing quarter on quarter. And uh, the way we are looking at it, uh, that today we have a great panel of uh, fa uh, lot of investors and uh, the one sitting right next to me is an entrepreneur plus investor. So he's going to talk about both sides of the table and uh, let's get into the discussion mode. And before that, if I could just give 30 seconds to each one of you to quickly introduce yourself, your fund, and then we'll just start the discussion. Is this on? Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. I am Vikram Mahajan, partner at uh, Unicorn India Ventures. Uh, we are an uh, early stage tech focus fund uh, based in Bombay. And we are investing out of our third fund, around a thousand crores in early stage, early stage startups. Hi, I'm Keshav Reddy. I'm an entrepreneur and investor, so I'm perfectly between everybody here. Um, I uh, I run a family office, so we invest in early stage software platforms. Uh, we have about thirty software companies, six unicorns in our portfolio. Um, Kata book, Cred, Upstocks, your first checks. Um, apart from that, I'm building a company in the identity space. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to, love to chat with you guys. Thank you for calling me. Thank you, Thank you so much. I'm Rajiv. Um, after six years as a VC partner, I'm setting up a new fund right now. Um, it's in stealth mode, so um, what can I say? So uh, besides this, of course, as a VC, I've invested in quite a few companies, uh, tech, gaming, AI, um, and uh, other places, so that's the climate, of course. Uh, prior to that, I've had corporate experience. I'm the one that's responsible for your Geo networks. I launched Geo in India, so as a GH marketing officer. And prior to that, with Infosys, about eight nine years in the UK. So I come from an operating background. Um, generally, tend to work with startups quite strongly and quite closely. Make sure that uh, they get the inputs that they need for them to grow. So that's uh, my background. Look forward to having an engaging conversation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. First, start with you, Bikram. Uh, in the current macroeconomic environment, I mean, I'll just uh, quickly ask about the dynamics only, which is the topic which we are discussing today. How that has changed in the current scenario? So, you're talking about GP, LP dynamic? Yeah. Uh, many of us don't realize that the funding winter is uh, not only for startups, for VCs as well. So, globally, if you look at the dream run that VCs had, from 2010 to 2022, uh, it's not there anymore. The VC funding globally is down by more than 30% last year, although private markets allocation are not down. Means LPs, especially institutional LPs, are actually overexposed, not underweight to private markets, but VCs, there are definitely too many VCs competing for the same set of LPs, be it institutional or otherwise. So given this new macroeconomic environment, there is a change in dynamic relationship between GPs and LPs uh, that I witnessed. And there are two or three areas uh, uh, where this is happening. The first is that there is more collaboration expected from LPs now. So the biggest asset class and the fastest growing asset class within VC markets is co-investments. So co-investments has grown by four or five times in the last 10 years. And now VCs have a, LPs have a taste of it. And they found that they are very good at co-investing and generating returns, alpha returns from there, or direct investing, rather than just investing in VCs. If I take a step back, uh, why do VC, LPs generally invest in VCs? An LP is typically an institutional investor who would say, I want consistent returns. I don't want to dance around the latest fad or trend. I want to invest for 10 years, I want to diversify my portfolio, and I want capital preservation as my first objective. Now compare that to a VC's orientation. 
A VC is on the other side of the spectrum, risk return spectrum, where a VC would say that I am a call option holder, I want to invest in risky assets, and I, each investment that I evaluate should be a fund multiplier for me. Now, given this dichotomy, LPs were always happy investing in VCs, but now that, that dynamic has changed. There's a new breed of LPs which is emerging, which I call roll up your sleeve LPs. So because of that, a multi-finance play is on where GPs and LPs are working together, not only investing, but decision making and operations as well. And this is good for the ecosystem because LPs are actually having influence on GPs to do what is right, what has not been done until now. The second area that I look at is that G LPs want GPs to have more skill in the game. That means they want GPs to commit more to each fund that they launch. And especially within this, if you look at the secondary market for GPs and VC funds, it is deepening globally. And in India, we are talking about continuation funds. And we find most of the GPs that they roll up 100% of their proceeds into continuation funds today. And LPs are more than happy to support such GPs. And the third area is, of course, transparency and communication between GPs and LPs, which has always been a challenge because VC, by definition, is an opaque asset class. So ILPA, when it was formed, uh, that is uh, Institutional Limited Partners Association 20 years ago, it has streamlined quite a bit of that. But even today, some of the LPs are confused between net IRRs versus gross IRRs, or they're confused between distributions versus paper NAVs, which is all changing now. There is more focus on distributions and that is where funds like us are actually stand differentiated when we talk to institutional LPs. And not only that, they are actually uh, playing the game up a notch. LPs expect GPs to diverge details like income, income to expense ratios, uh, the fund, le fund leverage and GP leverage ratios. And they want to have a say in their operations as well. So all this is good and GPs who will stand out and collaborate closely with LPs will, have, will position themselves for success. Uh, Rajiv, coming to you, have you witnessed the same in early stage investment space? Yes. So I think two things to add to the excellent points uh, Mahajanji made. First, I think uh, there is uh, there is an increased viewpoint around activism in the market today, right? So that activism from the GPLP community is coming from lots of places. One of the places is regulation, right? So we tend to think of uh, the Indian uh, government as being a little passive and laid back. They are not. They are very, very active, right? You have heard of SEBI. SEBI is now breathing down the necks of everybody, making sure that funds are getting close. That's the reason for the, uh, the secondary vehicles that he spoke about. Uh, they are active about how corporate governance works. About 60-70% of all VC money in the country is dependent on two sources guys like uh, Siddhi and guys like uh, SRI, they are also active, they are government money, so that money is also coming in. So that activism part is quite important. You can't play the LP or DP game without sort of having that governance uh, element getting more and more strong. That is one thing that's very positive for the uh, startup ecosystem, that's one. The second thing that I think has changed in the last six, seven years is there is a move towards specialization, right? So, you know, seven years ago, if I went to the market, mein, so, you know, you would have VC funds that were early stage, mid-stage, late-stage, and maybe pre-IPO stage, right? Today, you hear increasingly of funds that are very specific. You've got funds that are in gaming, you've got funds that are in AI. Keshav, you played all these cards, so, uh, you know, by the way, Keshav is a guy that you can play all the cards from all parts, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I think um, you've got guys like that, you've got climate funds, you've got uh, funds that are focused on retail, you've got consumer tech companies. So, there is a specialization that's happening and that comes along with the maturity of the market because you need to have more and more knowledge about these companies. So as he said, as you get more and more active, you need to start to help the startups. You don't just throw the check at the startup and they say, Karlo jo karne ga, right? So you have to try and do a little bit more of that and I think that's the second thing that's playing out. These are the two big trends I see, activism. The second one is really specialization. These two things are going to drive the future of uh, venture capital as we know it. Uh, Keshav, coming to you, since you run a family office, so most of the funds would be from the internal accruals only, I believe. So, I mean, uh, are you also a bit more conscious when you are investing in startups these days? So, uh, all 30 investments were co-investments. And I think we had this insight long time ago. Okay. Um, and the insight that we have is that the best 
entrepreneurs like if you're an entrepreneur you would go to sequoia or peak 15 first or you would go to tiger or you would go to certain like softbank back in the day so what we figured out is the best and i think earlier there was a nice statement about the 80 20 pareto principle the best entrepreneurs go to the best funds and that's given and there's the whole triangulation of even the vca community as the best top tier grade one grade two grade three so what we realized is that we actually go only do co-investments with grade A funds. And that's what has led us to actually have probably top quartile returns, um, even though we're a family office. By the way, family office are at the bottom of the pyramid. Nobody comes to you unless you've said no, 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 and then you go to them, right? So, um, so, so we figured out that we will only do co-investments. Uh, so that's one. Second is, um, as a family office, we have flexibility. I think that's what Rajiv was, uh, uh, was, was c communicating is that this year we'll do this, next year we'll do that. But our principles are very simple. Mm -hmm. Is that in early stage tech, uh, we will do platforms globally and that option not to invest is as important as that we can invest. And what that means is that in 2021, 2022, everything looked insane. We actually couldn't invest in anything because nothing made sense. Uh, even though we were VCs, we were active, we would see deal flow. Um, but if, if I flip the coin and I'm an entrepreneur, yeah. it was an amazing time, right? It was an amazing time to start a company, to build anything, and anything would get funded. So I felt there was a uh, there was a disc, uh, there was a, an issue in the market because there was easy capital, there was a lot of dry powder. Entrepreneurs who didn't deserve the capital were getting a lot of excess capital. That led to governance issues. That led to other issues. That do you know that if you actually calculate, and I, I want you guys to Google this. The largest companies, tech companies in India, check how many people have CFOs. It's, it's staggering. Very few have CFOs, right? And, and that, that is a big indicator, right? Um, for us, actually, what we used to do is very different. When we do co-investments, we stay forever. So like Upstocks, I was the first investor with Vani in 2015, October. We've never done a secondary, we've only did pro rata. So now we're the largest individual shareholder. Right? And the idea was we came in at, at, at that time, it was at um, 50 million. Now it's at three and a half billion. But I still feel we are just touching the surface. And the best part of being a family office investor is I'll tell Ravi, you have a problem, call me. Otherwise, I don't care. Right? So that's the best model, right? which we figured out that we never asked for an exit. So the model is flexible and also gives optionality to grow. So um, I think, and as now as a founder, I take all those learnings. I don't want an investor who's not on my wavelength, yeah. right? So because that doesn't work for him, it doesn't work for me uh, over time. And you never want an investor entrepreneur relationship to be sour. That will kill the company, right? You've seen time and again. So a uh, couple of insights, I'm just throwing out some ideas that, you know, the relationship has obviously changed. The dynamics have changed over the years. It used to be in the power of one side and now it's turned to the other side and if you have AI then you're great you know either side you'll make money so okay, okay. Vikram coming back to you uh, any insights or learning you want to share as an investor I mean uh, with the changing dynamics of the market how you, how lenses have now changed in terms of how you would look at investments in the current scenario so two three things um, uh, that have changed when I evaluate a startup today versus, let's say, 10 years ago. I, in fact, I started my startup investing journey in 2011. It was a personal care startup, not a tech startup. Uh, I gave them some money, they put in some money, and it became the largest consumer buyout story in 2020 by KKR called Winnie Cosmetics. They make fog deodorant. Uh, but times have changed now. So in terms of diligence, for example, when I evaluate, uh, there is a pre-term sheet diligence also that we undertake now, which was unheard of earlier. Uh, apart from financial and legal diligence, we also look at commercial and tech diligence, some of which can be done through tech and AI and databases. But that is a must now uh, as, as our frameworks are changing for diligence and our ICs uh, are becoming more institutionalized. And the third area is, of course, uh, as VCs, we have to be in the market. So it's, there's a term called pay to play in the term sheets. That means if you want to participate in the next round of fundraising, you have to pay and participate in the next round so that your shareholding doesn't get diluted as a VC. 
but it's not only that now it's work to play the expectation of founders is that not only will you fund them but also support them roll up your sleeves and be a partner on call uh, for any uh, area that they need help on so the value add frameworks that we call are also getting institutionalized so from gtm to fundraising to follow ons and that is why uh, unicorn india ventures i think has the high one of the highest reserve ratios which we what we mean by that is that our follow ons is 70% our first checks are only 30% and that strategy has played out well for us just like keshav mentioned we were the first investor in open bank which is which became the 100th unicorn uh in 2022 but even today because of our follow on strategy and a high reserve ratio we are one of the largest shareholders today and if from ceos to cfos they need any help they they would rather call us than ra than uh, larger institutional lps because we have been part of their journey for some time and also we now adopted the model of work to play rather than only pay to play Rajiv, for you, I mean, what kind of deals you are currently seeing in the environment? I think there are two, three things that are changing dramatically right now, and this is going to change much faster. So I think we were speaking about this briefly. Think about what AI means to a startup, right? So you know, in general, um, AI does one thing really, really well. It cuts cost of doing anything. Yeah. It just cuts it by a brutal amount, right? So if you are a startup that needed ten crores to do X, Y, Z, let's say marketing, ops. communication whatever right that 10 crores is now 2 crores that's what it means that's like insane amount of money that you don't need for you to build a business today right that's what ai means to anybody and everybody in the room you don't need to be an ai engineer or a prompt engineer for you to learn you just need to use it it's as simple as that right now what that means from a vc perspective is basically that it changes the paradigm for fundraising all of a sudden for me to get to a particular run rate of revenue if i needed x crores i need 1/5 of that today right and that changes everything that changes the capital structure that changes the cap table that means by series b that bloke makes so much of money that he doesn't need any more money until the ipo right so what happens to series c d e f um, pre ipo private equity funds and all right so those kinds of things are huge paradigms that are coming down the line that we are not even realizing that's one clear view point that i see right The second thing I see is increasingly IP is starting to matter. So there was a time when you know, even at Infosys, when I joined Infosys in early days, we were doing everything under the sun when it came to coding, right? Today, every company has got some very specific things that that the company is specializing in: engineering services, uh, you know, SAP ERP implementations. These are all completely different, very unique kind of things that's happening in the VC space right now. you want to do something specific in some industry let's say fintech you need to know a lot of things about regulation you need to know how the government is going to come down on you you need to know how securities get organized right or if you do something in gaming you've got a completely different game that you have to play to my mind i think that's the other thing that's changing that amount of intelligence that has go got to go into building a company because it's so much easier and so much cheaper to build a company now changes dramatically so it's all up to you right now in terms of making sure that that ip is coming into play if you get these two things right the world is your oyster sure. okay so coming to you uh, you uh, as we discussed you wear these two hats of an entrepreneur and an investor so i mean uh, since uh, you must be having a lot of learning so how are you incorporating these uh, on both sides of uh, your uh, journey that's uh, super super interesting because um, First of all, I think when you're an investor, your your lens is extremely different, and I think they both have really outlined a lot of those issues, uh, or you know the way you look at life. As an entrepreneur, on the other side, you just want to raise money, you want to move fast, you want to have a fa fantastic team, you want to be recognized, you want to scale, right? So one of the key learnings that uh, that uh, that I've taken away is one. build a company in a marketplace or a platform that has enough opportunity to pivot because if you get cornered in an area and the business model is not conducive it's a big problem that's one the second is actually you should figure out that there is a business model even before you start because what you're seeing today is a lot of businesses have started and later figured out when they're in the series e f g that hey actually there's no business model here and this happened a lot Uh, in india right uh, you know 111 uh, unicorns 
my guess is 30 to 40 percent will never be able to find a formidable business model except lending. Everyone will eventually go to lending. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that even before you start, it's important to see you know sort of the direction. So I feel like that's really really critical. And the third is actually today you don't need large teams. I completely agree. We at Equal is an identity company, and we're building in partnership with the India Stack. And we're actually sharing and building the layers around that, which is a B2B2C play. And eventually, it's a B2C play we're going for. Um, and in that, we realize, actually, with AI and the tools around AI, we have a cap of 100 people, max. We are never going to hire 101. And that is a learning from the entrepreneurs, uh, the investor side that I've had. Is more people is not more work outcome. It's actually inefficiency comes in and creeps in. Culture becomes diluted. A lot of issues come in. So what it's making me and my co-founder do today is that anybody who walks in the door has to be worthy of that 100. And now we've actually started hiring with AI knowledge or background because what they can do is disproportionately more than anybody without. So my other uh, learning or, or suggestion is train yourself in AI uh, prompts. You don't need to know how to build um, you know, software or algorithms or AI. You need to understand how to do the right prompt. And that will give you a skill set to do anything possibly. So a lot of interesting things. And then obviously, the fourth thing, if you're trying to build an AI company, great. You'll, 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 you'll raise money because a lot of VCs don't know what, what AIs do as well, by the way. So you just put the name in it. It helps at least get you into the door. The, the, the problem is, how do you stand out? There is no moat. There is no ability to stand up without marketing dollars. There is no, and this is a global platform today. A company in the Bay Area or Israel can actually come to India and actually you would have even, never even realized it's not from here. In the, it, and that is the dynamic that's changing, which is really worrisome for me. Is that any company can get disrupted from anywhere in the world using a wrapper of the best in the world and there is no moat. Uh, so that for me as a founder is probably the most uh, worrisome thing is that Will I be disrupted by somebody who I don't even know was in that line of sight? So that's really important as a founder today to figure out what is the moat. And, in, and the last point I'll make is start digital companies because those can't be disrupted easily. You know, you would have thought Uber is a great or a bad business model a few years ago because you had to get riders, you had to get assets, you had to distribute, you needed all that. But today I can argue that digital companies are the least likely to get disrupted because how you getting riders is a very, very difficult thing. And getting assets a very, very difficult capital and intensive thing. But building pure software platform can get disrupted very easily. So five learnings as founder investor on both sides. I'm uh, half half here and there. So. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, Vikram, uh, since we know that, of course, uh, the fintech space particularly has been under the scrutiny and uh, have seen a lot of regulations happening. So, I mean, in going forward, uh, as an investor, do you see other sectors will also be further regulated by the government or do you further want any kind of support from the government coming in? So, we know that uh, SEBI, RBI and other financial services industrial regulators in India are, they have laid down some of the best frameworks and we can benchmark them globally. So, and India's track again is enviable in its approach. The way NPCI was formed and the way uh, UPI has taken off in India. Uh, so, I will not comment on FinTech. I have huge exposure in that sector and regulations are evolving and changing and we advise our startups uh, to evolve themselves and stay ahead of the curve accordingly. But generally, if you ask me what is our expectation from the regulator in general, one is that see, as a fund, Unicorn India Ventures has a huge exposure to tier two and tier three cities. More than 50% of my portfolio is there, which other VCs perhaps are talking about. And we believe that by 2030, every VC will realize this, that it's not the airplane India but it's a scooter India where the next set of unicorns are going to come from. So our expectation from the government is that can they do enough for India stack? For example, they launched ONDC. Uh, implementing ONDC in tier two, tier three is quite expensive. Can 
the regulators subsidize this for tier 3 and two, tier 3 city startups. Uh, another area which I think Keshav talked about earlier is a missing G in ESG, governance. So what about startup boards? We talk about stewardship, we talk about startup boards, we talk about even listed startup boards. But is there regulation specific to startup boards? Can we expect a regulation for larger startups, for scaled up startups, let's say to begin with unicorns? If there is a certain, certain set of regulations for them, governance regulations especially, because these startups are representing India globally and smaller startups look up to them. So if governance is taken care of in these larger startups, other startups will emulate and also global LPs will sit up and take notice. Uh, another area could be, for example, and again, they should talk about sector specific uh, initiatives that the government can take. Uh, it has been very encouraging to look at defense programs like IDEX, uh, biotechnology supported by BIRAC. We need more such institutions. Can we have a body for health tech? Can we have a body for act tech, for example, which has been in bad news lately, or, or climate tech and others to support some of these initiatives? And then if you look at startup uh, incentives by the government, they are blanket incentives. Can we have performance related incentives for startups who perhaps are creating more employment than others or who are, uh, let's say, reducing more emissions than others? So I think some of these initiatives where the government can really change the landscape. Do you further want to add to it? Thank you so much. I think um, there are two things that I think uh, the government, general public can do. Uh, one is really around what I consider under invested areas. So if you think about the Indian market for venture capital, right? Because there was this huge catch-up that was happening, the tier two, tier three revolution that Mahajanji just mentioned. You, I mean, ever since we launched Geo in uh, 2015, 2016, you've seen this revolution. UPI happened, the India stack happened, and all of these created a big whoosh of you know just uh, revenue and business models that were built in smaller towns and cities. And that model has been something that everybody has jumped onto. But the problem in that process is basically only those models got funded. Right. So you had a consumer tech revolution. So most of the unicorns have been in fintech, consumer tech, those kinds of things. Right. Whereas we are a nation that produces the most number of engineers. And our IQ, thanks to the ruthless competitiveness of our colleges and how you get in there is insanely high. Right. They've got the cheapest IQ available anywhere in the planet per capita. Right. So why haven't we created anything in deep tech? Why haven't we created stuff that is really IP led? So I think one thing that we definitely and the prime minister is already doing it. There is now a one lakh crore uh, portfolio that is being created right now around, uh, you know, deep tech. Those are the areas that I think we need to, you know, create a lot more valuation and things around. Right? On the second one, I think there is a equitable thing. See, even the Silicon Valley model, for all its strengths, has created massive dissonances between the Aam Admi and the Khas Admi. Right. So I think that's something that we have happened. I think, to my mind, the entire thought process around the India stack, the digital public goods ecosystem, has to do with equitability. Right. That I think is a viewpoint that is happening. Take ONDC for instance as a viewpoint. The storyline very simply there is look, you know, that guy gets his fair share of what is going to happen in the market and that's going to continue, right? So Namiyatri for instance is a great example. Uh, you know, if you have caught, I mean, how many of you have used Namiyatri by the way? I just want to get as a guys, you guys need to go a little bit more out there in the market and use it. So, you know, that kind of stuff is actually telling you that the auto rickshaw guy keeps everything and he pays 24 rupees a day. That's all he pays for it. So I think those kinds of models are really, really good. Those are the two things that I would say are valuable in terms of where we are going. And uh, those would be the areas that I would expect some support on. Sure. On that note, uh, I throw open the floor for questions for, uh, from our audience. Please raise your hand and identify yourself. Can we pass on the mic here to the gentleman? Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Dhruva. Uh, this question is specific to uh, Keshav. So, as an entrepreneur, right, uh, you know. Uh, Just bring the mic closer. Yeah, sure. Monitor. Uh, so, as an entrepreneur, like, you know, uh, and an investor, when you see, uh, there, you might be seeing, or you would have already seen, with the same idea, people might be coming up. Uh, so, what is the, uh, as an investor perspective, what would be the unique uh, point that you will consider to put, to get on uh, to the next level? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, if I can rephrase the question, if there were two similar companies, what would make an investor sort of decide? Yeah, that's okay. right. I think the, 
the most important thing for early stage investing is actually the founder and the founder's vision and essentially figuring out who do you want to back if there were two founders with a similar idea and by the way ideas are a commodity right everybody has similar ideas of sorts um if there's early traction and execution those are the key things that you would look for so if there is um uh, i i generally actually look for a couple of things when i when i invest one is the size of the market opportunity second is are there signs of some moat that the founder is thinking like for example uh, there are some directions where he can stand out in the future third is of course the founder is most 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 important and then fourth is early signs of traction i i'm a, i'm an entrepreneur as well right you know that you, you uh, traction takes time you need to build you need to scale so a combination of those and i think there is um timing is underappreciated right time right place that's unfortunately everyone thinks it's all about having the right deck it's about the right time right place being at the right sort of deck in that moment right? today if you have an ai company and you're at the right sort of focal point for disrupting something capital will chase you so um never go and also i think people don't realize this actually if you're at the wrong industry at the wrong time you're never going to make it so you should pivot very quickly so like what i think rajiv was saying some industries just don't get capital how much ever you try as an entrepreneur you can do 1000 meetings but if that industry generally the dynamics are not working right um, you will never be able to raise capital so i think it's important as a founder to figure out industry timing um, ability to execute and succeed and also business model like vision of business model uh, you'll never have a business model day one but you should know directionally where you can possibly make money but yeah i hope i answered that question um, in the in the way you wanted it but yeah thank you thank you so much we'll be taking the last question as we're running short of time please keep the question short thank you so good afternoon my name is viraj shetty i am from prevalent automotive private limited uh, my question is in two phases one is to mr kesar i just wanted to understand uh, how can mod benefit the founders of a company and what should they actually work on so that the investors are also keen on investing my second other question is an open question uh depending on the ev space i just want to understand what are the investors looking out for for the investments and again uh, whether the climate tech is actually going to boom or not did you say moat i didn't catch that yeah okay so what does a moat mean to a founder okay got it uh make a moat to a founder is something only he can do right make sure that whatever you can do the others are unable to do or have need a lot of capital resources to be able to replicate so you have to figure out in an industry maybe it's first to market maybe it's network maybe it's density of product or maybe it's marketing brand or whatever that is and by the way you never know that on day one right once you go and figure yourself out in the ecosystem you'll figure out okay this is something i can do others can't do and that is what a early moat is and i'll tell you the other thing your moat will keep getting disrupted it will keep people will catch up so you need to figure out moats as you scale so what more today that uh, you know that you as a founder will have tomorrow will have to evolve so you may not know this but the, the idea is that you should double down on it and that is your advantage to an investor investors love moats they just love moats because they know that the capital is safe their rule number 1 is that lp should not call them and say where is my money right so they they would love for you to ensure that nobody else can replicate what these guys are doing so uh, work on figuring out a moat in the ecosystem that you can and where you are and keep evolving that moat as you keep getting more capital you invest in spaces which have more opportunity so that that would be uh, the idea to keep thinking about always let me answer the question on climate tech because that's an area of uh, deep interest we were uh, an early investor into a company in my previous fund called battery smart so that has become one of the most valuable companies so i think uh, the the challenge in climate tech unlike in other technology based startups is really that there is a capital formation element to the climate tech story as well so if you're going to create an ev story you also need to create a battery story somebody needs to buy the batteries and there's a capital that goes into creation of batteries for instance right that doesn't exist in other industries right you know you just focus on your story and the capital formation and the debt and the credit that's available there is available right the market figures out that what you can do you need to figure out a way where you can leverage the capital streams that are now being released by the government 
let's say Modi sahab says ki yeah i'm going to put some money into this space and there's going to be a lot of capital made available there try and figure out a way to get on back of that that would be a better route for you to take in terms of getting there because if the capital formation part doesn't work for you then your model will not succeed unlike in the traditional world so to my mind that's something that you face uniquely in your space which i don't think other people would face in general traditional tech kind of a story I Thank just you. like to add to it, uh, as a VC, if you're looking for VC funding, I'd rather invest in a climate tech startup, which is capital efficient, and uh, I'm not sure about market timing, but as an investor, it has never worked for me, and that is the advice I give to startups as well. Don't time the market. Assume that whatever you want to build, just build it out, and play along as regulations keep on changing. or as more players uh, come into the ecosystem find your place and your moat in the value chain that's a good point to start thank you thank you so much thank you uh, thank you gentlemen for such great insights and our investors are going to be around so please feel free to meet them and ask rest of your queries thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you.